Jeremiah chapter number 17. We're going to start at verse 5 and read through verse 10. But as I get into my message today, I'll pick back up at verse 1 and give you the context and fill in the details today. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse number 5, reads like this. But thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out to, by the roots to the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green. And it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. Then the prophet says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Lord, we thank you today for your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would take this message. Lord, lift it off of the page of the scripture. And let this written word become a spoken word to us today. Lord, let it apply to every detail of our lives, both personally, both nationally, and in the church. God, I ask it today by the grace that's only found in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Well, like I said, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Isn't it crazy to think that it's already February? I mean, Valentine's Day is right around the corner. It seemed like we were just celebrating Thanksgiving just a few uh, weeks ago. But uh, it has come quickly, and we're already about into the, uh, the end of the first quarter of this year. And it's absolutely astonishing how time flies. But, um, you know, the Bible tells us about time that we have to redeem the time because the days are evil. And we've got to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I, I want you to know, church, I, I was praying about, Lord, where should I go? Where should I go um, spiritually and theologically with the church over the next little bit of time? And I try to plan and see what the Lord says. And the Lord began to deal with me about our heart, the condition of humanity and how the, the drift is happening. I don't know if you know this or not, but we are in the last days. Uh, the last days started in the book of Acts, but I believe we're in what Paul talked about, the latter times. Paul said that there would be people who would heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears. That, that means that they only listen to those who tickle their fancy. And that's never been more easier to do today. In the age of YouTube and podcast and Christian television, because you listen to the preacher if you like him, and if you don't, you just flip to the one you like. You search for the subject that you like, and, and people are heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. And then the Bible goes on to talk about there will be a great departure or a falling away from people in the faith in the last days. And surely we've seen that. We've seen the deconstruction of major ministers who at one time proclaimed the name of Jesus. I'm talking about from gospel singers down who um, have one time held to the standards of God's word, have now come out and renounced the scripture and the inerrancy of the word of God and, and the inclusivity of the message of Jesus. Jesus Christ and, and all of those things. And so it begs us this morning to have a heart examination. And so the Lord gave me the title of this series and he, as he began to deal with me about spiritual cardiology. Spiritual cardiology. I asked you on Wednesday, how many of you have ever been to the heart doctor? And several of you raised your hand. The interesting thing about the human heart is that there are a lot of things that can happen without us even knowing it. Now, I know there are medical professionals in this room. We have nurses and CNAs, and we've got LPNs and all of the like, and people who work in the ER and things of that nature. So you see these things on a regular basis. And oftentimes, when it comes to the conditions of the heart, we don't catch it until some damage has already been done. The arteries have already been clogged. The heart muscle has already been damaged. But you know... When we think about a heart attack, we think about 
maybe Sanford and Son, right? That old show from the, from the 70s and 80s. And you think, oh, it's the big one, Elizabeth. And we think that, you know, it's this big show in front of everybody. And, and, but you know, there's a such thing as called a silent heart attack. And there are more silent heart attacks then there are these big catastrophic ones. Sometimes they're misdiagnosed. They might be misconstrued as a pulled muscle or pleurisy, or they might be misconstrued as, um, as some antacid issue like reflux or a hiatal hernia, some pain in the lining of the esophagus. There, there might be something that we misconstrue, and oftentimes people miss the diagnosis, but when they get to the doctor, and the doctor begins to examine through testing and EKGs and different things of that nature. They can find enzymes that have been released by your body. And they can tell you if you've had a heart attack. They can look at the scarring of the heart mu muscle. And they can tell you either you are healthy or you are not. The thing about the heart, though, is that you cannot see the physical heart. You have to open up the patient. And the surgeon, very carefully with his knife or his laser, can go in and diagnose and fix and correct the exact thing that's going on in the lives of the person. That's why it's important for us. Harvard News article that I researched and looked at this week began to talk about the importance of understanding your heart health. And church, I just believe spiritually that you and I ought to take periodic looks at our heart to see where's our heart? How am I doing? You know, there are two different times, of, uh, really three different types of doctor's visits. The first one is a, a checkup. You go there when you don't have a problem. You're trying to stay on top of things. You're making sure your cholesterol is where it needs to be. You're making sure that your blood sugar is not through the roof. And you're making sure that your weight is down. And the doctor's just, just an annual checkup. Men, your PSA is okay. Uh, ladies, you're checking all of your female stuff and making sure everything is fine. Those things are great. But then there are doctor's visits where we tend to go when things have gotten pretty bad. We don't know what's happening in our lives. The symptoms are out of control and we can't sleep. Our heart's racing and, 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 and we feel like we have a constant headache or our bodies are hurting. Then we go and the doctor looks at us and he makes a diagnosis. This morning, the title of my message in this first installment of our spiritual cardiology series, I've entitled it, A Divine Diagnosis. A divine diagnosis. Our scripture is found in Jeremiah chapter 17. And I want to give you some background of this young prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a mighty man of God. He wasn't popular though. God called him as a young man. Jeremiah, when he was young and he was struggling with the very fact that God had put his handprint upon his life and called him, and Jeremiah had all of the excuses and all of the things of why he would not successfully be able to serve the Lord. And God tells, tells him, says, Jeremiah, he says, here's what you, what you need to know. He said, from your mother's womb, I had ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, you, you need to not look upon the people's faces. You don't need to be driven by the pats on the back or the special offerings they give you, Jeremiah, or how many amens they shout from the crowd. Because Jeremiah, the Lord told him, let me be honest with you. You're going to be hated. You're going to be despised. And people are not going to like your message. But Jeremiah, I've called you to such a time as this. And Jeremiah began to get a download from the throne of heaven. Jeremiah chapter 1, 2, and 3 begins to talk about the iniquity of the people of God. God's holy people, Israel, they had been captured. The kingdom had been split to the northern and the southern kingdom. Israel to the north, and you've got uh, Judah to the south, and they're in a bad way. And God is doing what he does the best and he is trying to get Israel's attention. God did everything that he possibly could to show these people that he loved them, that he cared about them, that he had a plan for their life. 
You know, God revealed the plan of God to the Jews and gave them the law. We've been studying this on Wednesday night when Paul talks about Rome in Romans how the Jewish people were given the law to show the way to God. And, and these people saw the miracles. They saw the hand of God. They had the testimonies of the manna in the wilderness and the, the water from the rock, the, the quail that came from heaven and fed them in the wilderness. They had all of the divine testimonies of God's miracles miraculous power in hand. In fact, Judah means praise. Judah was named praise because they were to be the worshiping people. They were to be the people who sung the praise of God. Those who would give shouts of acc acclamation and those who would lift high the name of the Lord. They would sing the song of Moses that God delivered them from the, the, the Red Sea and the Egyptians. These were the people of God. You have to understand they had a relationship. These people had uh, a firsthand knowledge of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But God raised up Jeremiah the prophet. In the midst of a horrible time, in the midst of the history of the people of God, we see the downfall and the destruction and the decay. And in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1, I want to break into some context here with you for a moment. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1 says this. It says, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with the point of a diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the horns of your altars while their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills oh, oh my mountain in the field I will give as a plunder your wealth all your treasures all your high places of sin within all of your borders and you even yourself watch this shall let go of your heritage which I have give you and I will cause your enemies I will cause you rather sorry to serve your enemies in a land in which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. Then our text begins to start where the Lord says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. And the prophet contrasts that with blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And then he capstones that with the heart is deceitfully wicked among all things who can know it. The Lord, I the Lord, give everyone according to the deeds that they have committed and the fruits thereof. Jeremiah was raised up as a voice, a prophetic voice to God's people to call them back to a place that they had turned from and found themselves. Folks, I want you to know something. When you study the history of Judah, what's going on in Jeremiah 17, here's what has happened. God is wooing them to a place of repentance. He uses very strong language. The children are in children's church this morning, but here's the language the Lord uses in some of our older translations. He says, Israel has played the whore to the other nations of the world. She slept with every god under every tree. She was unfaithful to the God of Israel. And they, they, they did the abhorrent things. They lost their way. Where God had said, I will be your strength. I will be your shield. I will be your fortress. Understand, the scripture says by David and others that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. They, they had all of these precious promises that if they would put the Lord first, he would fight their battles. But at some place in their life, Judah began to backslide and they forsook the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They forgot the promises of God and they began to lean to their own understanding. Hello, somebody. They began to lean into the arm of their own strength. They began to call upon the idols that they had fashioned with their own hands. And God said their rebellion was so entrenched that it was engraved upon the tablets of their heart like a hard-edged diamond that are so strong that they can engrave metal. He said, 
That's how it is. He said, your children see it. They see your false altars. They see how you've worshipped under the grove trees. They see those things. And the Lord said, because, Judah, you won't repent, I'm going to allow you to go into captivity even further. And you will serve your enemy in a land that you do not know. The nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of God's people, there were several things that happened. Number one, they forsook the Lord. They turned their back on him. Number two, they put their trust and their strength in their own political power. They said, we know how we can fight this. Our armies are strong. Our po politics are in point. We can overthrow them with our own strength. They had deceived themselves to the point that they actually believed what they were saying and thinking. That's why Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 begins to tell us that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? We're entering into the Valentine's Day season. And you get all of the Hallmark cards and all of the pretty little sayings. And you have people say things like this. Follow your heart. It's not what the Bible says. There are over a thousand references to the human heart. This morning I began talking about the silent symptoms of the human heart. But I want you to know something. When the Bible speaks about the heart of a man, he's not talking about the physical organ that pumps blood within his chest. The one that supplies all of the oxygen and life to the rest of the body. That's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible's talking about the seat of the inner man. The place where his will and his emotions reside. It is a, a a, a deep connection between the spirit and the soul. And the Bible over 1,000 times gives us reference about the human heart. The Bible says, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Church, this morning, we have to guard our hearts. Paul said, let a man examine his own heart. Many, many times, in the scripture, the Bible tells us that the human heart is wicked. In fact, the prophet said, the Lord wants to give us a heart of flesh and change it from a heart of stone. He wants to make it from being black and decayed and make it white as snow. God is concerned about the condition of our heart. And as I begin to study this passage, and I begin to dip, dig back into the cultural um, applications of what was going on in the days of Jeremiah. You know what the Lord began to speak to my heart about? The Lord began to speak to my heart. He said, Brad, you know, it, it's not much different than today. He said, it's the same woman, but with a different dress on. The people of God are in the same condition. We have more than we've ever had. But when you look at the condition of our heart, Where's our evangelism? Where's our commitment to prayer? Where's our commitment to share our faith with others? Where's our fasting in the church? No, no, no. What happens is, like Judah, the people who are supposed to be the people of praise, the people who are supposed to be happy, because after all, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The people who are supposed to praise because the Bible says he inhabits the praise of his people. The people who are supposed to, to, to exercise dominion and authority over the adversary. We've allowed idols into our lives. We've allowed things to take away our passion and our fire for the things of God. And it shows I'm not talking about us in particular, but across America. The numbers don't lie. The numbers of churches that close. The numbers of pastors who fall. The number of, of churchgoers who've never read through their Bibles ever. The numbers of people when, when surveyed that they've been in church for 20 years, but they've never won somebody to Christ. 
When you look at the condition of the human heart, it's not much different. And Jeremiah, this young preacher, is preaching an unpopular message. People don't like him. That he's going through a hard time. If you read later on in the book of Jeremiah, he gets so discouraged and has a conversation with the Lord. He wrote a second book after this one called Lamentations. It's the weeping prophet. Because Jeremiah wanted to be accepted. He wanted to be loved. He wanted to be a bestseller, if you will. I'm paraphrasing today. But yet the people that he was sent to didn't like his message. But I thank God that today he's raising up a new group of Jeremiah's. He's raising up a new group of people who David Wilkerson has gone on to be with the Lord. Other great men like B.H. Clendenin have gone on to be with the Lord who were trumpets to this generation. But God has raised up and is raising up a new group of people who will say, thus saith the Lord who will call the church back to a place of truly seeking him. He said, your idols are before your children. Can I tell you something, church? One of the gravest things that happens when the church falls into spiritual idolatry is we lose the next generation. Our children see our excitement about church our children see our excitement about the things of God. They see the priority. They see our passion. They see our life, how we live it out in front of them. And guess what? It, what, what monkeys see, monkey do. And, and they oftentimes emulate and go into excess of what our parents, their parents have done. We find ourselves losing our way with the Lord. Then... Get ready for this one. It won't be popular. But much like Judah, we've also trusted in our political strength. How many Christians have I heard say, Lord, if we can just win the White House, if we can just get the right president, we can turn our nation around. Friends, can I remind you of the word to Zerubbabel? It's not by might, nor is it by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I believe in voting and I believe in, in a political system. Romans tells us to honor those that are in authority and God has established governments so that the world may not be in chaos. I understand that. But folks, my answer does not come from the east or the west, the north or the south. Our answer comes from the Lord. And unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We have to have our trust and our confidence back, back in the Lord. And Jeremiah is, is calling Judah to a place of repentance. And he brings us to where our text starts this morning. And I want you to go back and I want you to look at it with me. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man. And he makes his flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. If you're taking notes this morning, this first point comes right from our text. Number one, there's a curse in trusting the flesh. There's a curse that comes from trusting the flesh. Jeremiah says that a person is doomed, cursed for the curse when he trusts in the flesh. And by the flesh, he means in humans and human strength. Folks, let me tell you something. God uses people. God raises up people. God tears down people. But at the end of the day, listen, only the Lord's strength is what matters. But when we begin to put our faith in people, in our military power, in our political leaders, when we begin to put our faith in those things, here's what the prophet Jeremiah said. He says, when we put our faith in trusting man, our hearts turn away from the Lord. Let me tell you why. Because it is impossible to have your faith and your confidence in two things at the same time. 
Ask Gideon if God doesn't have a problem with us relying upon our own strength. Gideon had this big army, and he thought that, you know, God was going to do some big stuff. And God said, okay, Gideon, we're going we're gonna to whittle it down a little bit here. And here's what I want your people to do. And the ones that do this, that do what I say, they're the ones that will fight. Ask David how the Lord feels about trusting in the arm of the flesh. Because God told David, don't you dare, David. Don't you put a census on the people. Don't you go and number the adversaries. Because David, as a king, he says, well, I, I want to see how many troops they have. And I'll just add a few on there and we'll have more than them. And the Lord said, David, don't you number Israel. And what happened is David disobeyed God, and because he numbered Israel, the Lord allowed some things to happen. We can't trust in the arm of the flesh. You don't think God doesn't want us to trust in the arm of the flesh? I want you to ask one of David's men, whom the Lord had said, when I, the Lord, give you the city of Jericho, when you go from Jericho to Ai, when you go from the other places, he said, I don't want you to take of the spoils of the people and bring it unto yourself. But there was a man named Achan, who Achan had a bad heart. And what did Achan do? He took from the silver and gold of the treasury of the people and he put it under his tent. He hid it. Because isn't that what we do? We think because nobody can see it that God can't see it. I'm preaching now. And God sees every hidden sin. He sees every hidden iniquity. And guess what? Israel lost the battle. The smallest of people that they should have been able to win because guess what happened? They put their trust in the flesh. Let me tell you something, church. Putting your faith in anyone or anything other than the Lord, the prophet says, causes us to live like a shrub in a wasteland, just existing, not thriving, not fulfilling its purpose. We're in a place of emptiness. It's a salt land. There's nothing that's growing there, nothing that's living there, isolated, dry, and not fulfilling its purpose. There's a curse in trusting the flesh. Jeremiah is trying to drive this point home. But notice this. God never gives us a diagnosis without first also giving us an antidote. You see, the doctor, when he brings you in and he examines you, he might say, well, yeah, your heart's doing this and it's clogged up and you know, a doctor's going to tell you one or two things. They're going to say, well, we can't do anything else for you. You go home and get your life in order. Or they're going to say, here's what we would recommend. You need to cut this out of your life. You need to cut this out of your diet. You need to add this exercise. You need to take this supplement. You need to take this medicine, right? A doctor is going to give you a solution. Well, I want you to know something. The Lord is the perfect doctor. He never fails. He never does not have an answer to the problem that humanity is facing. And the prophet is coming to the people of God who catch this. They know better. But their hearts have been deceived. Get this. He says, cursed is the man who puts his trust in man. But then look at what he says here. This is powerful. Verse 7 says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he, watch this, shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out his fruit by the river. He will not fear when the heat comes, but his leaf will be green, and notice this, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will the cease the yielding of fruit, 
He contrasts here about the curse of following. And point number two this morning, if you're taking notes, is this. There's a blessing that comes from trusting the Lord. And I believe that like Jeremiah the prophet was calling Judah, the people of God, who were divided politically and their strength was in their numbers and their their trust had been turned and their affection had been set on gods of wood and stubble and, and stone. I believe God was calling them back to a place that we're about to see right now, which is the fact that there's a blessing when we trust the Lord. Let's look at what the prophet says. Look at this. We'll go back and read it because it is so awesome today. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. Notice this. He shall be like a tree that's planted by the waters. So the man who put his hope in man is cursed, and he's like a shrub in the desert who's not connected to any life source. There's no water in the desert. But Jeremiah said those who trust in the Lord, they're going to be like a tree that is planted by the waters, which spreads out. Notice this. It spreads out its roots by the river. It's going to be like this. A person who trusts the Lord, they are going to prosper no matter when or where they might be because their source, their supply, their life, their joy, their peace, their security comes because they're planted by the rivers of life, the rivers that flow from the very throne of God. Folks, I want to be planted by the Lord. I want to be planted by Him. And the Bible tells us some wonderful benefits that happen. Watch this, watch this. It says, they will not fear when the heat comes. You know what I've noticed about Christians who have lost their faith in God and put their faith in politics? They're scared to death during recession. How are we going to eat? How are we going to drink? You know, the Bible says, Jesus said that the Gentiles worry about those things. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he said, I'll add these things unto you. He said, consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. Birds neither gather and place into a barn. But your heavenly father has need and knows what they need. And he takes care of them. Are you not more than birds? Are you not more than a flower which is harvested and thrown into the oven? But no, God knows what you need. If my faith and my hope is in the economy, if my faith and my hope is in the stock market, I'm going to fear when the heat comes. But I'm glad that there is a fourth man in the middle of the fire. And whenever we're plugged into the life-giving source of Christ, he will make sure that we are secure and steadfast. Hallelujah. He says his leaf will be green. When everyone else is brown. Some of their leaves will be brown and shriveled up. But those who trust in the Lord, their tree is going to be green. You know what's, what makes the difference between people who are surviving and those who are thriving? Where their trust is. Our trust has to be in the Lord Notice this, and he will not be anxious in the year of drought. Won't be anxious in the year of drought. How many Christians I know that are so anxious, so anxious, who's in the Oval Office determines their joy or their victory. I'm going to be honest with you, they're more evangelists for the political party than they are for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's idolatry, folks. The Republicans aren't perfect. Democrats aren't perfect. The Tea Party's not perfect. The Independents aren't perfect. Let me tell you what the Bible says about the kingdoms of this world. The Bible says there's coming a day when the kingdoms of this world will come to nothing. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And only that which stands shall remain. 
And it'll be the kingdom of our Lord and our Christ. Friends, I'm telling you, we need prophets that will rise up in this last day who it doesn't matter who's in the White House or who's in the lead or who whatever, but they'll stand up and they'll declare, thus saith the Lord, and they'll call the people of God back to a place of holiness, back to a place of sensuality, back to a place of relying on the God of Scripture, not the God that we fashioned and formed with our own ideologies. People all the time say, I believe in God. They really do. But it's not the God of the Bible. It's a God that they've made in their own image. They give it worship. They give it praise. They give it offerings. But it's not the God of the Bible. Are y'all still with me today? But its leaf will be green and they will not be anxious in the year of drought. You know, the cure to anxiety and fear is to be planted. And the way that we're planted is we put our trust in the Lord. And he says this. He said, nor will they cease from yielding fruit. Mm -hmm. If you want to ask somebody... What does it mean to prosper in a time of famine? Ask Joseph. Ask Joseph, who when the political pressure came, said, no, thank you. Ask Joseph when Potiphar's wife said, I think I want you. And he said, no, thank you. Ask, ask the other people in the scripture who took a stand against the, the evilness of the day. And, and, and like Daniel, who would not bow down and worship the, the, the statue at the hour of prayer. Who wouldn't sing the praises of, of, you know, the Babylonian idols. Listen, ask him what happens whenever he stood up. When they, they came to the lion's den that next morning, spe- expecting to see nothing but a pile of bones, there Daniel is just whistling, I imagine, with the m- uh, lion's mouth shut, not able to swallow up the man of God. Listen, you can bear fruit, and you will not cease to yield fruit when your hope and your trust is in the Lord. No matter what the world does, what the world system does, what the economy does, when our faith is in the Lord, we will always be planted by Him and we'll produce the fruits of the precious Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and patience, meekness, temperance, and all of the other things which the the, uh, uh, Apostle Paul says, against such are no law. There's a blessing in trusting the Lord. Number one, there's a curse in trusting the flesh. Number two, there's a blessing in trusting the Lord. And number three, are you ready? I'm going to land this plane on this runway right here. There's a danger in following your heart. Folks, let me talk to you for just a moment. The worst kind of deception that is in the entirety of the world is self-deception. When a man or a woman is convinced in their heart of hearts That they're right when God says they're wrong. There are people that are utterly deceived. And that's where Judah was. God said they were so ingrained in what they were doing, it was written on their heart like a diamond had engraved something. There's a danger in following our heart. Notice, he said, the heart is deceitful. Look at that verse. Look at verse number 9 with me of Jeremiah 17. Pull it up on the screen, guys, if you don't mind. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't know if I put this one back there in the, in the, in the pro presenter, but look with me at Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. What does Jesus say about the heart? He says, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, Adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. Where does it come from? Out of an evil heart. Out of an evil heart. We cannot trust our heart. 
See, Judah had followed their heart, and it ultimately led to their downfall. By being deceitfully wicked, what that means is that our heart can convince us we're doing the right thing, and really, we're doing the wrong thing. Where does that leave us today? Where does that leave us today in 2024, in the condition of where our nation is, in the condition of where the church is at large? Where does that leave us today? I believe the prophet Jeremiah is saying the same things to us in 2024 that he said to the southern kingdom of Judah as they had turned back on the Lord. And it's this. Don't trust in the strength of man, but trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And examine your heart that it not be deceived. What's a key this morning? Is number one, we got to examine our heart. We got to examine our heart. We got to go to the doctor, folks. You know why? We can't see our heart, but the Lord can. The Lord can. And we got to say, Lord, examine my heart. Examine my heart. There's a danger in following this thing. It will lead you astray. We got to ask the Lord to search our heart. I used to sing an old chorus song that says, Search my heart, O oh God, make it ever new. There's another old chorus I think we used to sing that says, Take my heart and form it. Take my heart, transform it to be like yours, like yours, like yours. And that song said, holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness, holiness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness, righteousness is what I need. We used to sing songs like, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. Because, folks, here's the danger. I want everybody to stand up on our feet today. Here's the danger. The danger in following our heart. You ready for this? I want every eye to look at me this morning. The danger in following our heart is that we convince ourselves that this can never happen to us. We convince ourselves this can never happen to me. There is a big delineation, but a very thin line between pride and confidence. Between pride and confidence. We said, this can never happen to me. But the next thing you know, Judah had fallen. And if you read the rest of the story, it did not end well. We got to have a spiritual heart check. I didn't want to go into this this morning, but I will. I just got back from a funeral. I sat in my living room last night, pulled my family together. Look my boys in the eyes and I said, kids, let me tell you something. I said, don't you live for Jesus and then lose it all at the end. Don't you do it. One little crack in the armor and the adversary comes. And before you know it, you find yourself completely turned away from God. Folks, listen to me. 
clearly, please. I'm not talking about one sin makes a person unsaved. Good Lord, if that was the case, none of us had any hope. Salvation comes by relationship. When we offend one another, it strains the relationship. The offending party says, I'm sorry, would you please forgive me? And the other party should say, I forgive you. Let's move past this. Let's act like it never happened. That's the way our relationship is with the Lord. But you know, if, if, if you keep hardening your heart and turn away, that's a horrible place to find yourself. And this message right here, I've been living it this last three or four days. As I've laid on my bed and can't sleep at night, and I'm saying, Lord, 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 what, what happened? How? Why? What? And I'm going to be honest with you. Got a phone call yesterday morning from a very famous, well-known preacher that I've had relationship with. We used to live in the same town. And he asked me about my friend. My friend preached in all across the world. General counsel. And in a matter of six months, died in the arms of a harlot with cocaine and fentanyl in his system. I'm not God. His mercy and grace is far more greater than I've ever seen. But I would not want to go off into eternity like that. Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, every man runs a race that he might win the prize. So let us run with endurance. And then Paul says, I... Beat my body into subjection, lest I preach to others, I myself become disqualified. What's that sound like to you? So I'm thinking to myself, my God, what happened? And the Lord began to speak to my heart and said, Son, when you allow yourself to think that it cannot happen to you, that's when the enemy comes in.